the scripture lesson for the sermon for Christ the King Sunday in year A, as I mentioned before, this, the gospel lesson comes from the end of the book of Matthew. Matthew 25:31. Any is that familiar to anybody? That verse reference? Anybody that's ever come to my house and used the Wi-Fi? <laughs> now y'all know all my passwords are scriptures. <laughs> it's easy to remember. I mean, given what I do, you know. I mean, if I was an engineer, my passwords would probably be like equations and stuff, right? It's just, it goes with the flow. But uh, Matthew 25, 31 through 42, when I read it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, the sheep and the goats, right? It's funny, the younger generation, the word goat means something totally different. <laughs> Greatest of all time. Aunt Emily, you're the goat. I, I did not hear that, not once. Not once, but that's okay. Uncle Sean is the goat. Uh, but that, it, it, no, it doesn't, it's not derogatory. It means greatest of all time, so that's, the, that's their thing. Um, they had no idea that, I mean, this scripture calls people goats, and it's not good. But, uh, so here we are. We're reading from the Common English Translation again. <clears throat> Now when the human one comes in his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All nations will be gathered in front of him and he will separate them each from one another just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come. You, who will receive good things from my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared, prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then, now this is the most important part, so if you're asleep, you need to wake up just for this part. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Then, now this one's going to sound very familiar, <laughs> then he will say to those on his left, get away from me, you who will receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for you with devils and his angels. I was hungry, and you did not give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't do anything to help you? Then he will answer, I assure you, then when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous ones will go into eternal life. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. An actual parable that he told about the final judgment. I commonly refer to it as the sheep and the goats, but you might refer to it as when I was naked in prison and hungry and thirsty and you gave me the least of these. Right? If you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. <laughs> so sheep and goats. Everybody wants to be a sheep. Nobody wants to be a goat. 
unless they're, you know, Gen Z, which means something different. But Will Willimon is a former bishop, and he's a theologian and a writer. And, he, and he, in his commentary on this passage, he points out that the sheep and the goats are both just as dumb as each other. Neither one has a clue that they've done anything right or wrong. Lord, when did we see you that way? The ones that did didn't know. The ones that didn't do it didn't know. It's no excuse, but that's kind of, they all land in the same spot. They didn't know. Neither knew that Jesus was doing or what he was talking about. They both say, Lord, Lord, when? When did we see you? The righteous and the unrighteous, equally unknowing, clueless. Will Willimon calls them dumb. I'm not going to use those words. <laughs> but clueless is, is kind of good. You know, they didn't know. They said, Lord, when did we see you? Some of them did right. Some of them failed to do right. But neither were aware when they were doing it. It kind of calls back to that passage where, where Jesus said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. There's kind of a righteousness in not knowing or not doing something in order to that the grace of the sheep was not transactional. It was just what they did. It didn't have a purpose to it besides filling a need at a time. They weren't doing it in order to get into heaven. You see, that, that never was. They just had already done it, and then they get into heaven. And that's why I titled this sermon, well, Will Willeman titled this commentary this, the purposeless life. The purposeless life. Because when you act in the way that these people in the parable did, the ones that got into the, the sheep pasture, they did it without that purpose. They, they just did it. We're all looking for a purpose. And we start out, even as infants, investigating our world to find out what purpose everything has. What are our hands for? What are our feet for? Is this edible? Is pretty, pretty much the first question that every baby asks. They put every darn thing they can get their hands on right into their mouth. What is the purpose of this? It's instinctual. It's, it's within us to find purpose. It's a drive. But it's no different than a drive to have sex or overeat. <laughs> it's no different than any other drive we naturally have. Given the opportunity, we do it. And we abuse the drive to seek purpose. Oh, this is a sermon for the blessed beloved. This is a church sermon. This is for the church people right now. This isn't smoking and drinking and going to the movies on Saturday night, which my professor would say was sin. She was grown up, she was brought up to believe it was sin. This is, this is about our drive, us holy people, us amateur philosophers looking for purpose everywhere we go. Willeman says, to us has been delegated the work of God's kingdom. Because that's what this whole passage is about, the kingdom. Yet even as we work with conviction in that kingdom, we work with the assurance that everything really necessary for our salvation, okay, let me repeat that, everything really necessary for our, our salvation has already been accomplished by God. Our good works are responsive. They are praise for the great work that has already be, been done by Christ, our Lord and King. Now, the reason why this is important is, one thing, it's true, and we fail to remember it because we're very much motivated by what we can do to earn our salvation. Now, we would never say that, but we think it. It's ingrained in us. And... If we're working hard enough to earn our salvation, then we can look down our nose at people who aren't. But how do you know? 
Do you really know? Because the people that get in to the kingdom in this parable, they don't know they were doing the good thing. They were just doing their thing. They weren't doing it in order to get into the kingdom. They were just doing it. It kind of smacks you in the face. You're trying to be a good person so you can get into heaven someday, right? Everybody's doing it, right? And everything necessary for our salvation has already been accomplished. Does that change the way we look at the world around us and ourselves? Who wants to be okay with a purposeless life, though? Not me. But it seems like Jesus is telling us just this. Just relax. Relax. Let God give you what you need. Live your life in God. And God, who is purposeful in all ways, will take it from here. I'm the worst at this. This this sermon is for me, but you might want to hear, you know, overhear something that might lead it to your life. But I'm the very worst at this. I can't even go to a concert in Las Vegas and let it be just that. Entertaining. It's the same for Broadway musicals and visual art. Always looking for meaning, for purpose. Nope. For me, I'm looking for meaning, purposeful, definitive conversion. I will strangle the delight right out of an experience in my lust for meaning and a larger significance in my life. And they just didn't, I mean, the goats and the sheep, they just went along mindlessly. Willowman calls them dumb. But maybe God wants significance. You know the word significance? Oh, we're looking for some significance here. Well, really, the word significance comes from the root word that means a sign. It points to something else, not you. Not all the stuff you're trying to do really hard to make it point and to process and to see that nuance of purpose and meaning. Because when you try so hard to find it, that's not when it shows up. It shows up when you least expect it. When you get a little tap on the shoulder by the Holy Spirit and go, oh, oh that's significant. It's a sign that points away from you and your activities to God. Because God's life is full of purpose. And if we want to take over from God, we can live that purposeful life. But if we want to live in God, we can leave a, live a purposeless life and let God be the purposeful one. The purposeless life is the life of the sheep. And the goats, for that matter, they were the same. And it's the life that says, I have a God, I have a faith, and this Jesus who has done for me what I cannot do for myself, I have. This parable never tells us what to do. I mean, I know we think it tells us what to do, but it never imperatively says, you need to feed me because it might be me that's hungry. It never says, feed me, clothe me, visit me. We those of us here, mostly really in the walls of the church, here we infer all of that because we want to be sheep. But we have to go back to the beginning when the sheep says, Lord, we didn't know. When did we see you like that? So we can't, like, make ourselves into sheep. Because this parable says less about what we need to do and more about who God is and what God appreciates. But this parable of the judgment, it, it's done. There's, it's a done deal. There's no instruction. The people who have done, they've done what they've done. Some of them go here, some of them go there, and this is why. And neither group knew what was going on. And in our great quest to ensure our spot 
in the pasture with the sheep, we, like me, have choked the delight out of Scripture and the life of faith and the church. People come to church looking for meaning. They want me to have, I mean, good luck with that, but uh, they want me to have some, some message of meaning. I hope you come to church for community primarily, to see the face of another person, to experience love and relationships, because God is in that. Not in the theology or in the check off the boxes so I can live a better life. And I hope you'll be able to delight in the experience of being with one another. Or delight in the experience of being with God. Or delight in the experience of being with Scripture and letting it wash over you and not trying to strangle all the meaning out of it. When we have an experience or even a dream, people say to us, well, what do you think it meant? The best answer, given what the theme is here, is I don't know what it meant. But I know who does. A sign that points somewhere else. So let's not try to choke the delight out of the upcoming month. Okay? By this date next month, it'll what do we, all be over. Not for me. I like to celebrate after because, of course, I'm working until then. <laughs> it's not over till 12 days after Christmas. But, you know, it'll be the 26th of December in, in one month. And, and let's not choke the delight out of the upcoming holy days of Advent and Christmas. And let's just be. Be the sheep who unknowingly have made it into the kingdom and have been welcomed by the king and surprised by where they ended up and why. And that is really why we do the adoration on Christ the King Sunday. God doesn't need our praise. Rather, it is we who need to be reminded who the king is. When we join the angels prostrate before him when we crown him Lord of all and King of Kings. It's good news for us that we are not the King. It's good news for us to live purposeless lives. The purposeless life. Live the purposeless life. Just living in the pasture. Enjoying the sunshine and the rain and the love of the shepherd. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the out, Doc.